it. Now I'd like you to turn with me back to 2 Corinthians and chapter 2. Now, so 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'd like you to follow with me. You may have a different Bible to me, but that doesn't matter. The, the basic Bible will be the same, even though the wording may just be slightly different. Paul says, I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who's going to make me glad? But the same which made, which is made sorrow, sorry by me. These are sometimes difficult phrases, aren't they? Um, what Paul is doing is continuing to tell the Corinthian believers of his thoughts. He says, I made up my mind that I wouldn't come to you again with the full weight of my apostolic authority. You know, we, we don't really realise in our present day there are no apostles today. Not like this. People talk about the apostolic church. Well, let me tell you something. There is no apostles today. There's no apostles like the 12 apostles. They just, they just didn't have authority. They had extraordinary supernatural powers. Peter was able to know what people have been thinking about in private without even learning about it, nor by normal means. Peter was able to say to somebody, did you say this? And they say yes. He said, well, then you're now going to die. Would you like to be one of those people? I don't think so. Neither would I. You know, when Paul started on his first missionary journey, does anybody know what was the very first miracle he performed on his first evangelistic journey? He struck a man with blindness. Okay. Wow, you say. That's serious. Yeah, it is serious. This is the full weight of his apostolic authority. He says, I am determined I won't come back to Corinth like that again. I don't want to come to you with a heavy hand. That's what he means. He says, because if I make you sorry like you were, who's going to cheer me up? Oh, I see the point. He says, because if I make you sorry, who's going to make me glad? Come, come closer so I can see you. Except um, that you who, except you who were made to be sorry by me. Now verse 3. And I wrote this same to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to to rejoice. So what Paul is saying is, I, want, I wanted to come and see you. You are the people that I led to the Lord. You are the people that I saw weep their way into salvation. You're the people that I was like a nursing mother bringing you to salvation. Now he says, he says, um, I've written to you, I've written this to you so that when I come, I will not have crushing sorrow because you ought to be bringing to me tremendous rejoicing. Paul was a man of emotions. He's not any different to you and me. We're all people of emotions too. And some people are very frightened of emotions. There's nothing wrong with being frightened of emotions. Of course, we mustn't rule our lives by emotions. We mustn't let emotions take over our critical thinking. It's very easy to let that happen. Um, and, and we need to keep a sense of proportion in life. It's a bit like when someone's bereaved. They don't want to bereave too deeply. When they're happy, they don't want to go all silly. When they're having a joke, they don't want to go all mad. Um, and so it's like everything in life. There has to be a certain level of moderation in our lives. But he says this. He says, I have confidence in you all. Isn't that a lovely thing? He says, I believe in you. I believe in you, right? That my joy is the joy that you all have in the Lord. You know, these letters are very personal. They're very personal from Paul, backwards and forwards. <coughs> Verse 4, he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Now we know, didn't we? we? We said how that Paul wrote a letter to them. But it was a harsh letter. And God the Holy Spirit has not preserved that letter for us today. It's not part of the Bible. That's a letter we've missed. Um, now the important thing is this. When he was tearing off a strip, 
He wasn't doing it just because he was angry. How do we know that? Because at the time in which he was doing that, he was weeping profusely. You see, Paul, when he has to discipline people, he doesn't do it because it's an ego trip. He disciplines people, but it hurts him more in the discipline than the person. See, it's like the little boy who said to the teacher, or the teacher said to the little boy, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. He says, oh, well, please give me two, not one. And that's a joke, of course. You're allowed to laugh occasionally. But the important thing is, Paul was writing in discipline in the previous letter, not the first letter to Corinthians, the one in between. He's writing to them with tears on my part. Not that you would be upset, but you would know the great love I have for you. And you think, wow, wouldn't you like to have someone that loves you like that? It's an amazing man, you know, the Apostle Paul. He writes this really harsh and strong letter. <coughs> but he's doing it because he loves them. And he does it with tears, no doubt, when he'd finished. The letter would be covered in tears. And here Paul opens his heart and he opens his mind. And he discusses the dilemma of the pastor who loves his people. And yet he has to rebuke them sharply for their own good. That's a dilemma, isn't it? That's the sort of dilemma a parent has when the little child he constantly wants to go and put their hand in the fire. And in the end you have to smack the child. Not because you hate the child. Not be it's because you love the child. People automatically assume in life today that, um, that pain is automatically bad. And that to inflict pain on somebody else means that you hate them. That isn't the case at all. I don't know parents that hate their children when they discipline them. It's not hatred at all. Um, <clears throat> and so he discusses the dilemma of the pastor who loves his people so much that he has to rebuke them sharply for their own good. And his tears tears his heart apart when he's doing it. Now that's the sort of pastor you need. And that's the sort of pastor Paul was to them. Alright, so he wasn't their present permanent pastor in the church. You know, the New Testament churches, they had a sort of a spiritual development. If Paul turned up at Philippi one week to start a church, then everybody that's going to be in that church is going to be a brand new convert. They've been saved a week. So which one of them is going to be the elder in the church? <laughs> Nobody can be an elder after a week. Who's going to do the Bible teaching? Well, what's going to have to happen is this. They'll have to... The Holy Spirit will minister from among themselves. But Paul and Timothy and Silas will have to exercise leadership over that church from afar. That's the biblical model. And of course, as time goes by, as people mature, and some people are already mature in life anyway, and they blossom and develop and become the leaders of the church, Paul then can stand back a bit and become an advisor to the leaders. And eventually he might even get to the point in which he is able to stand aside and say, look, we really trust you, you now be the leaders of this church. And of course, on other occasions... Paul would educate somebody like Titus and he'd send Titus to a series of churches and say, right, go back to those churches and find and itemize and recognize those that God has raised up as leaders and enable the church to recognize the leaders that God has given them. That's a great ministry, isn't it? So you can see, can't you, that churches have this developmental uh, process. Verse 5, but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. You know, there's some verses in the Bible which are just plain difficult. What he's saying is this, if any of you has caused grief, I want you to know that you didn't grieve me. Now, when he says causing grief... Um, he, what he means is this. There were people in the church at Corinth that were really bad. There were people in the church at Corinth that were childish. 
And there were people at the church of Corinth who were sexually mad. And they were committing gross sins. In fact, some sins were so bad that even the people in the area around about didn't do about as bad things as that. And not only did he do those things, but he was proud about it. And the church was really, yeah, great. No, that's all wrong. The fact that the world says this is the sexual morality that we should have, that doesn't mean to say that we say, okay, let's do that. Isn't that great? No, it isn't great at all. We need to have morality based upon the morals of God. Not upon the morals of the general understanding of society and the praise of men. That's we're not looking for the praise of men. He says, I want you to know that you have not grieved me. Just to accept a little. Verse 6. Sufficient to say that such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many there were lots of people in the church that inflicted their punishment upon this man and they did it by excommunication now excommunication it means the ban it doesn't mean that you hurt the person or beat them up it means that you just remove yourself you explain kindly look I need to remove myself from your company because I cannot condone what you're doing and not only that but I believe that what you're doing is a bad testimony in the world in fact if people said to me is that person a Christian I would say well I don't really think so really or maybe the person's a Christian but they're certainly not living like it but they're not living like it. So sufficient to such a person is this punishment. That's enough. That's enough to turn the heart of many a man when it's inflicted, uh, which, which is inflict, inflicted on him by many. So the contrary, you ought rather to forgive him and to comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Let me explain that. What he's saying is this. That man has been punished enough got that yes he did a really bad thing he went off with his stepmother okay now then he suffered enough all of you made him suffer enough you need now to forgive him now I want to say something to you here and to anybody that ever hears these messages go all around the world to thousands and thousands of people. And I want to say that the purpose of excommunication is not designed to get rid of somebody. It's not designed to say, right you, out the building, wash our hands of you, never talk to you again. That's not excommunication. That's the most godless thing you could ever think of. Excommunication is, yes, we need you to put yourself to one side. We need you to consider yourselves to be not in fellowship with us. We're going to be not with you. But, but that's with the intention that you might repent of your sin and come back. Because we love you, actually. You're one of us, actually. We want you to repent of what you're doing and leave your stepmother. And get yourself right with God and seek his forgiveness and get yourself right with your brethren and come back. We want to forgive you. We want you to come back. I wonder how many excommunications end like that. That's what excommunication is. Excommunication isn't to destroy Christians. Excommunication is a means of restoration for Christians. He says, so he suffered enough now. You need to forgive him now. I wonder how many people... I wonder what the number is. I wonder how many people, when they're put out of a church, that church goes to all lengths, all lengths to bring them back. And when that person is officially put out, and I understand that in the early stages of a situation, the relationships are hot and the issue is a hot potato. It's very difficult. It's when you've got a bad wound and you go to the doctor and he says, oh, can I touch it? And you go, no. It's painful, you see, initially. But there does come a time when you can touch it. Just this past week, I was walking down the street in Shrewsbury and Ken was coming the other way, the man who was um, elder here. And we met and we had a great conversation. First conversation we've had in six, seven years. But the interesting thing is this. The pain had gone out of the situation. See that? There was no 
the pain, the years had passed. And we were able to show mutual respect for one another. We were able to understand one another a little. See what I mean? That's what the purpose of restoration is. It's about being able to forgive one another. And it's also uh, being able to comfort the person who is so depressed that he can go deeper and deeper into a depression. That's what Paul says. He says, your job is not to crush him into the dirt. That's not your job at all. Your job is to punish him, yeah, but not too much. You're, you're to punish him to the point in which he wants to repent. And then you're to forgive him when he does. And then when you've forgiven him, you bring him back. And you don't let him get destroyed by you. Wow. So now what we see is excommunication. Not all about destroying Christians. Excommunication and sometimes separation amongst believers is so that we might be restored. Verse 8. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love towards him. Now, I think that's beautiful to you. If I wanted to put it in my words today, I would say this. He says, please go and tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you love him. You couldn't, you couldn't say that to him when he was in his sin, when he was in his hot-headedness and when he was off doing what he was doing. You couldn't say it then. It wasn't appropriate then. He needed to feel the full weight of church discipline then. But he's now in tears of repentance. He needs now to be told we love him and we forgive him and we want him to come back. That's what, that's what you need to do. Do you know this this second letter? I, I, I'm beginning to it's beginning to become one of my favourites already. It's amazing what Paul says here. Verse nine: For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you are obedient in all things. I have written that I may know whether you are really going to follow the Lord in this matter. I was looking for evidence of your faithfulness to God in dealing with somebody in your church that sinned and how you will manage them and how you will plead with them and how you will discipline them and how you will bring them back. Now we've got to say something here. There are people that never come back. There are people that never return. There are people that just cannot come back because they cannot bring themselves to come back. But that's not because we hate them. Now, do you see the point? We would do everything and everything in our powers to help them. And of course, in church life very often, people often don't know what the pastors or what the servants of the Lord have to do to talk to people there are some issues in life uh, one of the apostles talks about he says there is a sin unto death there are certain things that never do get fixed in this life but they get fixed when they meet the Lord Jesus then it carries on until they die they cannot they cannot get back until they die but often often it's able to be done. Verse 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Let Satan, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now that's a little book I'd like to write sometime. I'd like to write a little book. It's, I've got a, a list on this computer, funnily enough, of all the books I'd love to write. I've just completed about my 99th book. I've just submitted them, by the way, to Trinity College in India um, as part of a doctoral program. But the important thing is this. I'd like to write a book called Satan's Devices. What are his tricks? One of his tricks is this. Is to cause divisions and misunderstandings in the church. Not over big issues. Maybe the colour of the hymn book or the colour of the wall. Or maybe some silly thing. Whether you should put a flower there or whether you should put a flower. I've seen churches split up over issues of this nature. Now this is what Satan does. And then what he does. He makes it such a thing that people cannot get over themselves to be restored. They cannot. 
And I know great men of God. I'll give you one example. You don't know the guy. But there's one a man of God that I know. And you know what? He's one of the best Bible teachers in England today. And has been for a very, very long time. Let me tell you something. He cannot get over himself to say sorry. And to be restored. Wow. You say, that's amazing. Yes, I know. Sometimes you can have all the knowledge in all the world, but no grace. And that's the thing, you see. So he said, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, To show the respect that I have for you, I will stand by the decisions that you make. <coughs> and if you... <coughs> Excuse me. And if you forgive the man, then I'll forgive him too. Satan would love to bring a wedge between us and we're not ignorant of his tricks. Wouldn't it be great for Satan if he could put a wedge between Paul and the Corinthian church? This church that he'd founded, this church that he'd suffered, this church that he'd been there for a long time teaching the scriptures, he was effectively their pastor for a long time. A church where there were Jews and there were Gentiles and they were really thriving in the Lord. They had all the spiritual gifts, they had everything. And Satan comes along and he puts a wedge between the Corinthians and Paul. And he just taps on it and taps on it and taps on it and it gets wider and wider and wider. He says, we, we understand about Satan's tricks. And what Paul is doing is this. Paul has already exercised his apostolic authority. <coughs> He's exercised his apostolic authority over this person that has sinned. Now then, it could be, couldn't it, that Paul and the church at Corinth could get out of step with each other. And that they could turn to Paul and say, hmm, he's a bit hard, isn't he? Or it could be that Paul could turn around and say, oh, this church at Corinth, don't understand them. They're too soft. And what does Satan do? He sticks the wedge in between the two and he just keeps tapping it and tapping it and tapping it. And what do you think of Paul? Well, I don't think he was that good on that situation. And he tapped it again. It's just to Barnabas. And what did you think? Well, I think Paul's a bit hard at times. So then he tapped the wedge again and it just gets wider and wider and wider. Paul says, we're not ignorant of, the, of Satan's devices. We will not submit to his wicked plan. Okay, we won't submit to his wicked plan. And what Paul does is a marvellous thing here. And I want you to watch this very carefully. He has come to this man in his full apostolic authority and disciplined him, possibly before the whole church. But he turns to the church afterwards and he says, Right, you decide whether you'll forgive him or not, and I will back you up. And if you decide that you're going to forgive him, then I will too. He, in other words, he places the lead of church discipline in their hands. He says, look, you're the leaders of the church. You decide. And I trust you to make the right decision. And whatever you decide, I'm right behind you. Do you know that takes a tremendous amount of maturity on Paul's part to be able to trust them? Because they hadn't been very good in the past. But he trusts them. He says, I trust you to do the right thing. But they also, when they hear Paul saying, I'm trusting you to do the right thing, they think to themselves, we better do the right thing then, haven't we? And so there's this great, not a wedge between the church at Corinth, but a union between Paul and the church at Corinth, in which they're going to work together. They're going to have the same mind on issues. He's going to allow them to take the lead. And whatever they decide, you'll stand by it. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, anybody know where Troas was? Well, you've heard of Troy. Anybody seen the film, Troy? Well, Troas and Troy are about the same thing. Very close to it together. The city of Troy was just very close by Troas. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. A door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. 
But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now listen carefully to what Paul is saying. He says, I also want to say that when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, a great opportunity for serving God was opened unto me. But <coughs> I had no peace in my heart. Why? Why wouldn't he have peace in his heart? A great effectual door is open to him, so why wouldn't he have peace in his heart? Because Titus wasn't there. You say, well, did he have to stop the work of God because Titus wasn't there? Yes, he did. He didn't continue with it. Even though there was a wide open door, he didn't do it. Why didn't he do it? Because, you see, Paul believed in, in working together. He believed in not going off on a limb and doing his own thing. He believed that they should work together. So he said, I took my leave and I went looking for Titus. I went to Macedonia trying to find him. Because really, you see, the work of God is something that should be shouldered by more than one shoulder. I couldn't say that when I was a boy. Got my teeth in today. It can only be shouldered by more than one, one soldier. No, no, shoulder. Verse 14. Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus and maketh mani manifest the savour of his knowledge. Notice it's not saviour. It's the savour of his knowledge. That word savour, it's similar to the word we use in the kitchen when we talk about savoury. Okay. And, uh, and he's, I'll carry on with it and I'll explain what that means in a minute. He maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ in them that are saved and in them that are perished. To the one we are a savour of death unto death and to the other the savour of life unto life. Now let me explain what that means. So Paul, he breaks forth into thanksgiving to God. It's a little hymn of praise again. He does this a lot. Thanksgiving to God <coughs> for his own life and ministry. Paul was ever grateful of the honour of serving Christ, especially in the light of his own perceived unworthiness. He says, may God be thanked who always causes us to triumph. Christ causes our ministry to always overcome all obstacles and situations in the end. Does that mean that Paul never had setbacks? Well, of course, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say we didn't have setbacks. What he's saying is we, we may lose a little battle, but the war is won in the end. That's the point. And he makes known all of the sweet smell of our ministry. That word savour is smell. So when you walk into the kitchen and my wife's been cooking, I go... Oh, that's lovely. The word savour is something that God does when he smells a burnt offering. Not because he wants to eat it. But because that burnt offering, he, he smells the burnt offering. And it reminds him of the beauty of his son's sacrifice. So it's a beautiful smell to him. Okay. And um, he makes known all of the sweet smell of our ministry, which is in the revelation of Christ, in every place where we serve him. Our ministry in the word, well, that means in the preaching of the gospel, our ministry in the preaching of the gospel is the, to the Lord a sweet smell to those who are saved and to those who are unbelievers. Now, to the unbelievers, our ministry is the smell of death, which leads to destruction. And to the believers, our ministry is the smell of life, which leads to abundant life. Now I'm going to let you go home and think about that. That's big, isn't it? That's, big. That's serious stuff, isn't it? And then let's go right down to the last few words. And who is sufficient for these things? Who is sufficient for these things Paul asks this rhetorical question he's not asking him to reply he's just thinking the question aloud who is sufficient for these things who is sufficient within themselves how do I think I'm sufficient to be pastor what I'm not sufficient you know nobody is sufficient in himself in these things 
Paul well knows his own inability. <coughs> he understands his own unworthiness. He constantly reminds us. Nevertheless, <coughs> he has no mock humility. Because that's pride, of course. Mock humility is pride. He knows his ministry is a blessing to his hearers. He does not put down, he does not put his himself down to the power of his own personality. He doesn't consider his success in ministry to the power of his cleverness in thinking or cleverness in speech. It's not down to that. In fact, Paul deliberately takes all of his oratory and puts that in the trash can and talks plain. That's what he does. Rather, he realises that, that he is blessed on the basis of three things. He's blessed, first of all, because of the beauty of the subject that he teaches, and that's Christ. There's nothing more beautiful than when he ministers on the subject of Christ. Secondly, he ministers in the enabling power of the Holy Spirit in which Christ is preached in power. If you went and listened to Paul preach, he may not look much, he may not sound like much, but when you listen to what he has to say, you can feel God there. This is why Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he talks about preaching, he says, people shouldn't come out of your services saying, that was interesting, shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be coming out of your services just saying, well, I learned something today. This isn't an educational program alone. We do learn things. They should be coming out of the preaching service saying, Wow, God was there. And God spoke to me. That's what they should be saying. They should be saying, like the apostles did, this a fearful thing to listen to the preaching of the gospel. Wow. It says in the Acts of the Apostles, nobody wanted to join them. Got that? That's the sort of church you want, isn't it? The sort of church where nobody wants to join, and yet the Lord added to the number those that were being saved. Wow. And lastly, his success in ministry is measured in direct proportion to his willingness to submit to a life of walking in the Spirit. Verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Wow. That's a, that's a real test. And Paul is being very frank. He says, look, there's an awful lot of people out there that corrupt the word of God. You say, what do you mean? You mean the Bible? No, whenever the phrase, the word of God is used, it's not talking about the Bible. What's the phrase or what's the word that's used when the Bible talks about the Bible? Go on, you can answer. It's the scriptures. Quite right. Give that man a dog biscuit. See, you've been listening, haven't you? When the Bible talks about the Bible, it calls it the scriptures. So what's the word of God then? Well, the word of God is the spoken message of salvation. Now he says we don't corrupt the spoken message of salvation. Why is that? He says there are people that spoil it. Do you know, one of the things that saddens me, it really does sadden me, is how many people have a lot of zeal and love for the Lord and what they talk is a load of rubbish. How anyone ever gets saved sometimes I wonder. They get terms muddled up. They get a verse from Isaiah and a verse from the Psalms and one out of John and shove them together and say, there you are, there's the gospel. You go, no. It doesn't make a coherent sense at all. There needs to be some sense to it. There needs to be some logical understanding to this. Just the other day, talking to a young man about the Lord's return, and he was telling us that the rapture and the coming of the Lord are the same thing. I said, well, it can't be. Why not? I said, this isn't a matter of opinion. This is just a matter of fact. They can't be. And he went, well, they just are. He said, no, no, it's not. It's not. Even if I didn't believe in it and you didn't believe in it, it still can't be true. It's logically impossible. And he said, I don't understand you. Why? I said, because when, talks, when Paul talks about the coming of the Lord in chapter 4 of Thessalonians, he says, you're ignorant of it. But when you get into chapter 5, he says, of the day of the Lord, you know everything. I don't need to tell you anything. Now, how can you be ignorant about something and know everything about something at the same time, unless they're different events? 
There are going to be different events. You can't be ignorant and know everything about something at the same time, can you? It doesn't matter whether you believe in it, it just cannot happen. And so that's the point, you see. There needs to be, amongst those that communicate the message of the gospel, there needs to be clarity of thinking, and there needs to be sound biblical exposition. I went for a walk last night, and I was thinking of a threefold chord. One of my favourite expressions in scripture. A threefold chord is not easily broken. And my ministry here is based on three things. It's based on the correct exposition of scripture. It's what I do every Sunday. We want to understand what the Bible really says. You don't want my opinion, do you? I'm not trying to give you my opinion. I'm trying to tell you and expand for you what does the scripture actually say. If it contradicts everything that we've ever known before, then we'll have to chuck all that away. The point is, what does it say? That's the point. <coughs> so that's the first thing. Correct exposition of scripture. Second thing is, um, compassionate pastoral ministry and that's something I'm challenged about and so it's going to be my proposal that over the next year or two years or whatever till the end that I will be spending time with each of you but I won't be pinpointing you I won't be buttonholing you I just want to help you I want to understand you and I want to be able to help you to develop what you would like to do and what God has called you to do that's my work and thirdly is to help the church to reach out into the community with a faithful Christian testimony. And that's something, again, that we need to talk about. So we're going to be doing that. And then coming right to be down to the last bit, it says this. He says, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So what he's saying is this. We will minister the message of God in sincerity. There's going to be no mask. What you see is actually what I really am. That's what Paul is saying. When you, when you met Paul, it was written all over his face what he thought. There was no mask. If he was happy, he looked happy. If he was sad, then he was, looked sad. There was no mask. It was sincere. And Paul never had thinkings and teachings that he hidden away. Or oh, I better not tell them that because they might get rid of me then. No, there was complete, it was all out on the table in front of them. This is what we believe. Complete sincerity. And he says, we preach the message that we receive from the Lord. Doesn't matter whether it's the baptism, Baptist confession of faith. Doesn't matter whether it's the Westminster confession of faith. Doesn't matter anything about that. We preach what the scriptures say before God. And lastly, we do it in the presence of God. Now, I don't know whether you, you ever think like this, but I want to give you a bit of an image. <clears throat> when Stephen was being martyred, he says he looked up and he saw the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, on that day he saw the Lord Jesus, but on the previous day <coughs> he was standing in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin giving his final testimony. The testimony that would seal his testimony in blood, his own blood. Now let me ask you something. Stephen didn't see the Lord Jesus standing then when he was giving his testimony. But may I suggest to you that that's exactly what he was doing. When Stephen was giving his testimony, the very last testimony that he ever gave before he died for his faith, the Lord Jesus was standing there and watching and hearing every word of it. Now that's a challenge to those who were preachers and teachers. I'm here today preaching the word. The Lord Jesus is standing at my side. He hears every word and he either approves or disapproves. And that changes how I am. Because I'm going to be, a, you don't have to be accountable to be a preacher, do you? But I do. And one day I'm going to have to account for every idle word. I've got to make sure, like Ken used to say many years ago, that what I say is the truth. Because one day I give account for what I say. And so Paul had this overwhelming awareness of the presence of God in his ministry. And that meant that he was careful what he said. 
He didn't put into it his own ideas. He didn't tell everybody what he read in the newspaper that week. No one's interested in that. He didn't tell anybody his political views. No one's interested in that. He didn't tell anybody what he thought about Trump. No one's interested in that. No one's interested in your political views. When you come to preach the gospel, no one's interested in that. They're interested, what is it that God has to say to us today? And in the presence of God, I'm going to tell you what God has to say. That, he says, is the ministry of the word. We preach and we teach Christ and we have no other subject but him.